Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Nate Samhat, president of Wofford College, and I'm pleased to sponsor this symposium series on race and justice, along with George Tyson and the Tyson Family Lecture Series. Dr. Tyson is a 1972 graduate of the college who has supported Wofford in a wide array of areas, including environmental studies and sustainability, and as a mentor to students in the college's pre-health careers program. This series is about doing what we do best at Wofford College, engaging in ideas and conversations with civility and respect within the context of the liberal arts. This collective experience will feature readings, scholarly discussion, and opportunities for the greater Wofford community to reflect on issues of race, social justice, and politics in our local community and in our nation. This evening's focus on voting uh, is on voting, and we have several speakers to share various perspectives on this topic that, with the election just weeks away, should be critical to all of us. And of course, with the sad passing of Justice Ginsburg, it makes this election even more critical in so many ways. Joining me this evening are Mitchell Brown, an attorney and Equal Justice Works Fellow with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. He'll discuss his work in voting rights restoration and political re-engagement. Dr. David Alvis, Professor of Government and International Affairs at Wofford, will share insights on straight ticket voting. He'll instruct us a little bit on straight ticket voting. And Karen Mitchell, President of the Spartanburg League of Women's Voters, is here to talk about the suffrage movement and why women are vital to our political system, especially today. Well, as forever, <laughs> I'm pleased to welcome student panelists, Marcus Stallings, representing the Student Athlete Advisory Committee and their voter registration and social justice initiatives, Molly Wells, president of College Democrats and Christian Wright, president of the College Republicans. There'll be a brief time for questions after each speaker. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. Also, please know that we are recording this event. It will be available at wofford.edu slash Wofford Votes, as well as under the town hall icon at wofford.edu slash coronavirus. So let's begin with Mitchell Brown. Mitchell, welcome to Wofford. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to come and speak today and to share uh, a little bit about my project that I work at work on at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I have a, a special uh, connection to the South. My family is from North Carolina and I actually worked for a judge in South Carolina before I came to this job um, at SSJ. So I'm really appreciative for for the invite. Uh, as, uh, as stated earlier, my name is Mitchell Brown. I'm counsel at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, uh, where I work on a project called the Criminalization of the Ballot Box um, through the Equal Justice Works uh, Project Fellowship uh, component. And my project uh, around the criminalization of the ballot box uh, concerns the reenfranchisement of those who have felony records, uh, as well as uh, working to make sure that people aren't prosecuted just because they have a felony record and they vote uh, and they just happen to be ineligible. Um, in North Carolina, we have a statute that states that if you're ineligible due to a felony conviction and you have not finished your sentence and you vote, uh, then you are guilty uh, and can be found guilty of voting illegally um, in the state of North Carolina. The issue with this is that is what is known as a strict liability offense, which means that it does, does not require any intent on your behalf uh, in order to be uh, found guilty of, of, this, of this crime. Uh, that's a problem because many people in North Carolina, they don't know whether or not they're eligible. Um, in North Carolina, it has a very convoluted system where if you haven't paid your fines, your fees, or your restitution, uh, if you have, uh, if you think, even think that you're remotely eligible to vote and you just wanna you know, cast your vote and let your voice be heard, under, this, under state law, you can be found guilty of this crime. Uh, and what we've seen is that this, this statute really affects black, black and brown voters in particular. Um, in 2017, the state of North Carolina had, uh, did an audit of the 2016 election. 
and found that 441 people voted while they were ineligible, uh, meaning that they have a felony conviction. They were not finished with their sentence yet um, because they were on probation or they hadn't paid fines and fees uh, and thus were on probation still. Uh, and they were found to have uh, possibly voted while they're ineligible. The issue uh, with that is some district attorneys in the state of North Carolina decided to prosecute these cases uh, because they had the, the ability to do that under the law. Whereas some other DAs found that uh, it wasn't worth prosecuting these cases uh, because there was no intent required. Um, and that's a major issue <laughs> that, that, that we see uh, because there's this narrative of voter fraud that's being uh, passed on throughout our society. Uh, but in this instance, if people are voting while they're ineligible, they're not voting with the intent to defraud the state of North Carolina. They're not voting with the intent to try to sway an election. They are literally are trying to let their voices be heard and they made a mistake. And because they made a mistake, now they can be, they can be found guilty of a felony offense and face two more years in prison. Many of these people, uh, may have just left the prison system, or they may have received a felony conviction but didn't go to jail, um, and they are unsure about their eligibility. And so, and, and their goal is to get as far away from the criminal legal system as possible. And yet, with the statute, if they go vote because of a mistake, they now are pulled right back into the system that they tried to escape from. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, there was a case in North Carolina, North Carolina State Court. Uh, in which the uh, Wake, County, Wake County Superior Court, so that's in the Raleigh area of North Carolina, if anybody is familiar. In the Wake County Superior Court, uh, the court found that the state of North Carolina can no longer disenfranchise voters uh, if, they, if the only uh, part of their probation that is left is that it will fines, fees, or restitution. We've seen this in Florida as well with Amendment 4, uh, where uh, the, originally the federal district court in, uh, in the Orlando area found that again, the state of Florida could not disenfranchise voters if, only, if the only thing they owe is fines, fees, or restitution. Uh, sadly, uh, in the, around the same time the North Carolina ruling came out, and beyond Bonk, uh, you know, sitting of the 11th Circuit, which means all the judges in the 11th Circuit, they've uh, overturned the district court and found that Florida's statute, uh, which uh, gave life to the constitutional amendment allowing the reenfranchisement of those felony records was was legal, and so in North in uh, excuse me in Florida, now if you owe fines or fees or restitution and you have not completed payment of those, you can be disenfranchised in the state of Florida, um, and that that's a minor setback, um, and we don't we're not sure if the lawyers for for the the plaintiffs in that case will uh, bring it to the Supreme Court, but there's this theory that if you, oh, if you owe fines and fees, then you have fully, not fully completed your sentence. Uh, these people are no longer in jail. They are now living in our communities and they owe fines and fees, fines and fees that they may never be able to pay back. Uh, some people owe thousands and thousands of dollars. And because they owe this money, they can't pay it back. They know their voice is taken from them now. Uh, and, and that's a problem. And that's why I'm fighting back against that in North Carolina. So I'm working with lawyers in Florida to, to help uh, them with, with their case as well. Uh, and, you know, trying to make it better and make sure that all eligible voters are able to vote. Now, let me be clear, you know, I want to ensure that I'm not saying that if you're ineligible, we want you to go vote. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that if you are eligible, given the state law, whether it's North Carolina law, Florida law, if you are eligible, we want you to be able to vote. And we want you to be able to let your voice be heard I, but we want the state law to not discriminate against uh, people of color. We want the laws to fit the, the ends, uh, you know, that the state is trying to go after. If the state wants to prevent voter, fr voter fraud and make sure that only eligible people are able to vote, we need to make sure that the laws are clear. And if the laws are unclear, then we have a duty to challenge them and make sure that they're clear. Nobody should be prosecuted because they don't understand the law. Uh, and, and the state, and also that nobody should be prosecuted because the state failed to let you know that you aren't able to vote. We, you know, one last point before, before I open up for questions is the state of North Carolina has, has stated uh, several times that its notice requirements for those who have felony records is 
uh, is derelict. Um, <laughs> they, they are holes in the system of notice. But yet, because the state law, because the state law has a uh, strict liability requirement, the people, there, there's no intent required, you can be found guilty of it. Um, and this law is traced back to 1875 when it was passed with the, the explicit intent of disenfranchising Black voters. After Reconstruction, uh, Black voters were gaining power in North Carolina and were overtaking the number of white voters. And because, and after Reconstruction, uh, in a period of what's known as reclamation, uh, white, <laughs> white supremacists tried to uh, come in, and, but not try, they actually did, they succeeded um, in making it harder for black people to vote um, by charging them, you know, either with violence uh, or outright uh, disenfranchisement through, through the law of charging them with felonies and therefore they're disenfranchised for life. Um, so there's a strict, there's a definite racial component to it, um, but also because of strict liability, people are prosecuted for making mistakes and, and we have to fix it. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Well, uh, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Use the Q&A, if you will, um, but I get to ask a question. So, uh, Mitchell, when the Supreme Court um, uh, voted on the Voting Rights Act here, mm -hmm. this was a couple of years ago, right? And, and yes, kind of the test mm -hmm. for state law. How what impact do you think that had on these kinds of state laws when it comes to voting? I, I think it, I uh, thank you for that question. I, I think it had a, a, a uh, harmful impact. Uh, when, so for those who aren't familiar, uh, the case was Shelby County Beholder in 2013, where the Supreme Court stated that the formula for preclearance under the, under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was unconstitutional. Uh, because in the words of Justice Roberts, or in the sentiment of Justice Roberts, voting discrimination did not exist, does not exist today in the same way that it existed in the 1960s. Um, and that part is true. I, I will agree with that statement. But part of the reason why it doesn't exist the same way today in 2020, or in that time in 2013, like it did back in the 1960s, is because of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in, in the words of, of the late Justice Ginsburg, uh, dismantling Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Uh, and, and so like, the reason why there, there were not these atrocious voting rights uh, issues from 1965 into 2013 is because of preclearance. Uh, and so states like uh, statutes such as the one I referred to, the voter prosecution statute, uh, this was already on the books. And so it didn't really, like that, that case didn't really affect how, this, how you know, the statute would, would play out in the state of North Carolina because it was already on the books. But for example, another example I would use is voter ID laws. In North Carolina, there was a voter ID law that the Fourth Circuit said targeted black voters with surgical precision because the legislature created a voter ID law where, it only, where the state was only going to accept certain IDs that black voters dis disproportionately did not have. And so because of the lack of preclearance, it allowed for voter ID laws such as that one, uh, which was uh, you know, found to be unconstitutional in 2016, it allowed those laws to exist. It allowed a proliferation of voter ID laws across the country um, to uh, combat this narrative of voter fraud. Now, I, on that point, I will not say that voter fraud does not exist. It does exist, but it does not exist in, in millions of people are not committing voter fraud. There's very small numbers, uh, given a very large number of votes um, that, that have been cast. Uh, and so uh, that Shelby County allowed for the proliferation of voter ID laws and, and for states to go unchecked. So now, whereas voting rights lawyers such as myself, we have to now bring a case um, against uh, the state to get, uh, make sure that people's civil rights are, are not hindered. Okay, good. Um, uh, well, uh, just a quick comment. Um, well, here we have a, we have a question. So uh, from Mary Blackburn, uh, North Dakota doesn't require voter registration. How does that affect voter fraud and what are its other impacts? Uh, so, 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 so North Dakota, so I'm not as familiar with North Dakota um, and its voter registration statutes. Um, and so, the, so the question is that North Carolina, does, North, North Dakota does not require voter registration. 
Um, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I can't even attempt an answer to that. I'm not familiar with that because um, I'm not sure how uh, they would know what voters are able to vote. Uh, so I'm not able to answer that question. Yeah. Okay, here's uh, one more and then we'll move on to Dr. Alvis. Uh, what are the restrictions, do you know the restrictions on formerly incarcerated people who wish to vote in South Carolina? So, um, ten tangentially, uh, my, my focus on my project in North Carolina, um, but in South Carolina, I believe it's the same as North Carolina. You have to finish um, your complete sentence. So that includes uh, your term of probation and or parole, uh, which includes your fines, fees, and restitution. Uh, and so uh, the right to vote is conditioned on your ability to pay, uh, which is what we were trying to challenge. And one of the things that needs to be fixed uh, because that is a modern day poll tax. Um, you know, you, if you need, if the state wants you to pay back, you know, your fines, fees, restitution, I'm all for it. I got it. I understand it's the state's prerogative to do that. But to condition somebody's right to vote on their ability to pay, that's a poll tax, <laughs> uh, plain and simple. And and uh, we have to challenge that. So that, that's my understanding of South Carolina's law. Okay. One quick, uh, uh, one more um, question on, um, uh, on, on, uh, your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, what does your organization, uh, what kind of work does it do to reform the criminal justice system or in what ways does your organization work? Yeah. In that so, so, so at SCSJ, we have voting rights section, which I'm in, but then we also have a justice systems reform team um, who does a, lot, does a lot of criminal justice reform. Uh, one of the things we're working on now is uh, abolishing this, working to abolish the school to prison pipeline. Um, as a former teacher myself, uh, there's a lot of criminalization of young people, uh, mainly young, young black and brown people in schools across the country uh, where students who are 12, 13, 14 years old, or sometimes younger, are getting criminal records, uh, you know, for, for simple conduct, uh, you know, issues in school, uh, such as hitting somebody in school, tripping somebody, the list, list goes on, um, you know, nothing that should warrant getting a criminal record over it. Uh, and, and as a former teacher, things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, and so that's one of the things we're working on, um, but also just making sure that in, in terms of my project, making sure that people aren't prosecuted uh, for, for voting while they're ineligible. And if they are, uh, representing them in court and making sure that they have an adequate defense uh, against being prosecuted. We don't want anybody to get a separate felony record uh, more than what they already have. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, we're also working to expunge their records as well. That's one of the things that is really big in our, in our efforts. Okay, great. Well, Mitchell, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate the, the comparison uh, and analogy to the poll tax, which I think mm -hmm. is very apt in this case. And thanks for your good work. And uh, no. we're turning it over now to uh, Dr. David Alvis. David? Thanks, Nate. All right. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm grateful for the invitation to uh, be a member of uh, this very distinguished panel. And um, I just want to say, first of all, I, I study most of political institutions, so I won't focus so much on who votes or who to vote for as much as how we vote and how that affects minority participation in politics, particularly uh, the African-American vote. And recently, the uh, states of Michigan and Texas uh, respectively banned an electoral practice uh, known as straight ticket voting. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the uh, political, with the electoral process, one choice you have when you enter into the uh, voting booth is either to choose your candidates uh, for political office individually, and that's known as split ticket voting, or you can just hit one button for the party, and that's straight ticket voting. Now, uh, Republican legislators in Michigan and Texas, as you probably suspect, uh, prohibited this practice for partisan advantages. Uh, but they could get away with it, uh, this rather naked partisan uh, maneuver, because there's a general perception that straight vote, uh, vote ticket voting is bad. It's bad because it's lazy, it's bad because it's undemocratic. You know, good citizens uh, ought to be choosing the right people, not party labels. And I wanted to see on this, there is some truth to the complaint that straight ticket voting today is a sort of arcane kind of dated relic uh, of a past age. Uh, straight ticket voting is, is useful when you actually have disciplined political parties. And in the age of political machines during the 19th and first half of the 20th century, 
that was actually your only method of voting. And straight ticket voting was the means by which those party machines held, it, held its members accountable uh, to the party leadership. So let me offer you just kind of an anecdote of how this process worked, right? There was a, a representative, a congressional representative from the Hyde Park District in Chicago named Abner Mikva. And um, when he first got into politics, he wanted to help out uh, Adelai Stevenson, uh, who was running for governor. And so he decided to go to a meeting of the, um, I think it's the eighth ward of the Chicago's um, Democratic Party. And he walks into the eighth ward and there's the political boss with the cigar, right? And he says to the political boss, you know, I'd like to help out the party in this next election. The, boss, the political boss takes the cigar out of his mouth and says, who sent you? And, Adam, and Mikva responds, right, well, nobody sent me. And the political boss responds to him, well, we don't want nobody that nobody sent. <laughs> and Mikva says, no, look, 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 seriously, I, I, wanna, I wanna contribute to the party, right? So the political boss says to him, well, how much do you need to be paid? And he says, I, I don't need, Mikva says, I don't, I don't need to be paid, I, I wanna volunteer. And the political boss says, well, we don't want nobody that don't wanna be paid. And so he Mikva persists and says, look, you know, I, I really want to help out the party, right? You know, let me volunteer. And finally, the political boss says to him, where are you from? And he says, well, I'm from the University of Chicago. And the political boss says, wait, wait there. That's it. We definitely don't want nobody from the University of Chicago. And I want to show kind of what this anecdote illustrates about how the old political party system worked. It mattered who sent you because you can only trust someone who's been vetted by the party's network, right? Political bosses. And it matters, right, that you, that he didn't want to be paid because someone who can't be bought can't stay bought. And then finally, it's a problem that you're a young person in college because young people have principles and ideas and therefore they're kind of reluctant to support the sort of wheeling and dealing compromises, which is what political machines do. So today, right, if you look at our political party system, it's, it, the campaigns are filled with young, unpaid, principal people who volunteer on the basis of their conviction. And they're not vetted by some backroom political hack, and they can't easily be bought. And so I, I wanna tell you, as a representative of the curmudgeonly disillusioned old people, that's the problem with politics today. Yes, the old political machines were corrupt. They use graft, bribe voters, and control political office holders with a sort of iron fist. But one thing you can say about the old political parties, they got things done. Today, every piece of legislation has like a thousand veto points. And because practically every other senator is running for the presidency, no one can really afford to compromise on their uh, ideological convictions. So when you can't discipline your members, the only thing holding the party together is ideological purity. And when it's ideolo ideology, right, there's no room for compromise and there's no pragmatic decision-making. So consequently, very little gets done today. In Michigan, right, a federal judge actually struck down Michigan's ban on straight ticket voting under the Voting Rights Act and the Equal Protection Clause, because in the opinion of the district court, it harmed African-American voters in the state. And while the decision in some ways was particular to the details of Michigan's politics, I actually do think that the absence of straight ticket uh, voting, and more importantly, the lack of a strong disciplined party system is actually harmful to black voters. If African-American voters, I think, justly complain that they have little to show for their voter mobilization efforts, efforts after a general election. You know, as one cynical pundit recently put it, yes, Black Lives Matters to the Democratic Party, at least until November 3rd. I, I, I wanna try to think about how you explain the disenchantment of uh, African-American voters with the Democratic Party. And there's no simple explanation, but let me offer one possibility. Commentators are often surprised that African-American voters support establishment candidates rather than candidates whose message might seem to resonate more with their interests. So the recent Democratic primary was an interesting illustration of that. 
Warren, Elizabeth Warren and Sanders would seem to be more in tune with the economic concerns of many African-American voters, at least more than Biden. Yet Biden received overwhelmingly larger support among African-Americans than either Warren or Sanders. But the black support for the establishment candidate, however, is actually less surprising if you consider a couple of facts. Number one, establishment candidates have concrete relationships with the black community leaders, and they sell their connections rather than their ideological views. Second, a majority of black Democratic voters self-identify as moderate compared to white Democratic voters who identify as liberal. I don't think this reflects a difference necessarily between black and white voters uh, over their over policy in so much as it reflects a difference over attitude. Whites commonly identify with ideology, whereas black democratic voters tend to be more pragmatic in their orientation. They want concrete changes rather than ideological purity. And they actually have more to lose than their white counterparts if the opposition is elected. Now, if you think about it, delivering concrete benefits is precisely what the old political machines were really good at. Unfortunately, African-Americans did not benefit from these machines in an age when there was explicit racial hostility and most Blacks lived in a condition of penury that was far more severe than most of the immigrant members of the machines. But today, income levels and education levels among African-Americans are significantly greater. And while there is still a problem of systemic racism, outright hostil racial hostility of the Jim Crow sort is no longer a major obstacle to participation in the Democratic Party. In fact, Black voters are expected this year to constitute 24% of Democratic Party voters, nearly one in four votes. So I think a discipline, more, more disciplined party system would actually be good for African Americans for two reasons. Number one, it would provide the kind of institutional structure that black, the black community needs in order to make concrete gains in areas like police reform, healthcare, and employment opportunities. But it would also moderate the more radical voices for change that often I think receive disproportionate attention and media coverage. For in an ideological age, the extremes tend to gain the upper hand and drive elections. But what generally follows for African Americans is disaffection and alienation. So I wouldn't give three cheers for the old political machine, but I do think that maybe one is better than none. Thank you, David. Um, uh, that's an interesting take. I, I appreciate it. Uh, and um, we have a question here, uh, uh, but a comment first. Let me go back. Uh, George Korn noted uh, in relation to the North Carolina case that Judge Henry Floyd Wofford 70 uh, and a member of the adjunct member of the government department here uh, with Dr. Elvis was on the panel that struck down that requirement in 2016 on the Fourth Circuit. And uh, we also, Clyde Hamilton, who just passed away, another Wofford grad, and Dennis Shedd, uh, Wofford grad, all on the Fourth Circuit. Um, we have a couple questions. So uh, the first one is uh, a comment or, or a question from uh, Carol Player, Dr. Carol Player who uh, asks that you comment on mass mail-in ballots beyond normal absentee ballots. Um, with voter harvesting in vogue, could not much more voter fraud occur? And why not just allow anyone who requests a ballot be sent one with no restrictions? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's a, it, it really, the voter, the, the concern right about the mail-in uh, voting, right, um, is it turns out it's, it's kind of more of a technical question, right, than, um, than one, right, that's really kind of fielded very well by political scientists, right, it's a matter of technicality, and that is, can these votes, right, um, be adequately authenticated, right, through the, uh, uh, through the postal system, right, or um, is there a, is there a, a, a serious, right, uh, occasion for substantial voter fraud? And I, you know, in all honesty, I got to admit that the technical debate on that issue, right, is one that's beyond me because I, I've never been fully able to understand, right, what the process would be by which you would uh, authenticate those, authenticate those votes. 
Um, I do think, though, that there is a concern that unless there is an explicit means, right, uh, by which those, uh, the authentication of those votes uh, can be demonstrated, right, the problem may not be voter fraud, but rather the perception of the legitimacy, right, of the, uh, of the process. And so it's very important that, you know, if we make a decision about this, that there be some clarity about exactly how that authentication can be done. Hmm. Um, uh, there's, uh, I have a, a comment um, and kind of a, a question, or maybe both questions, both are questions actually. Um, one is, are, are you suggesting, Dr. Alvis, a return to Richard Daly style machine politics? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, I, there's a, <laughs> look, not everything was great, right? I did say, right, not three cheers for political right. machines, but you know, one. You know, there, there were, I, I think Daly's uh, machine, right, has been, um, uh, um, I, I think it hasn't received the due that, it's, that it deserves um, because the, it was, I mean, in, term, in, in terms of delivering things for constituents, it was actually quite effective. Now, I mean, it was also too, obviously, grossly corrupt and it's often, right, uh, quite unjust. Um, but the, um, also too, you know, for the African American community, um, it had a kind of 50-50 record. Um, on the other, on the one hand, I mean, Daly would often kind of demagogue issues, right, when he didn't need uh, votes from the, from the South Side wards. Um, so he would, he would cr create a racial animus um, uh, against the South Side. On the other hand, Daly did more than almost any other, right, of the um, um, uh, mayors at the time of promoting and uh, getting into federal um, uh, office holding, uh, 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 federal positions, right? Uh, African-American uh, political figures. So, I mean, in some ways, right, um, there, was, there, was some, there was some benefit, but the record is fairly uneven there. And it's really not until, really until the fragmentation of those political parties that you get a candidate uh, for mayor like Harold Washington in Chicago, right? Uh, first. Uh, black mayor of, uh, of Chicago. Good. Um, very quickly, uh, we have a question um, that uh, African Americans, uh, um, uh, are they disillusioned with the Democratic Party? And um, do you think that really is the case? And on what basis would you? Yeah, I think that the, um, that on delivering in terms of concrete benefits, right, um, I think uh, many African Americans, right, majority of African Americans, are in, are disillusioned uh, with the party in terms of its ability to deliver, right, uh, on concrete issues. And I think that in some ways, because the two wings of the Democratic Party are locked in a contest in which African Americans have an interest in both, but they have no way of bringing them together. And that is, you've got kind of identity politics on one side. And then you've got uh, progressive economic reforms on the other side. I mean, African Americans really benefit from both issues, but kind of what's at tension in the party, right, are the two wings, and they can't, they haven't been able to effectively bring that together. I think a sort of disciplined constituency um, in which African American voters can be effective could actually bring those wings of the Democratic Party together. Uh one very, very quick comment, and we're running a little behind here, but just uh, because there's another question that, do you think this, uh, this divergence perhaps is a, is a function of generation? Uh, is there a generational uh, gap in, in Black American, in the Black American electric? Um, would, uh, um, would younger generations or, or younger, the younger Black community be, um, more ideological in nature than um, than the older uh, generations and yeah that that's an interesting question right so how does it work out generationally I, I mean I, I suspect to the older generation tends to be the more pragmatic right in the young younger generation you know as the nature of politics right tends to become uh, more and more ideological though when measured against, I think, uh, white counterparts in the, in the Democratic Party, still less ideological than, the, than whites, right? And, and at least that's what polling appears to show us. Yeah, yeah very good. Thanks, David. Thank you. Um, now, Karen, it's your turn to speak. Um, 
on suffrage and women's involvement in, in politics today. Uh, this is an historic year for us. Uh, so um, uh, please, i turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this discussion about race and justice, voting rights, responsibilities. I'm going to talk a little bit about suffrage, but I'm also gonna talk about voting itself. Uh, first of all, I do feel a need to tell people what is the League of Women Voters because a lot of people get mixed up about that. I want to tell you that the League of Women Voters is a grassroots organization that believes its men and women members can help perfect our democracy. And I want you to know we are nonpartisan, we are political. So I want to make sure you know from whence I am speaking. Um, just a, a few things. First of all, voting. What about voting, rights and responsibility? Voting is power. Who has the power? Who wants the power? And I think it's important for us to understand a little bit about our country and voting in order to look at what's happening today. And I want to tell you that not all democracies vote in the way that we vote. And I want you to think about the fact that there are lots of other ways of doing things. So for instance, Australia. In Australia, if you do not vote, you are fined. That's correct. If you do not vote, you are fined. I'm sure there are challenges with this, but my point is they want to hear from everyone. They want to hear everyone's voice. Now I want to tell you, we'll just review a little bit about the history of how we got to where we are right today with voting. So we've got the constitution that says states can decide and states decide white men who, who own property or pay taxes, they can vote. Then starting in the early 1800s or so, some states go, oh, okay, poor men, white men can vote too. So we got lots of poor white men voting. 1870, after the war, after the Civil War, black men can vote, but wait, we've got all kinds of obstacles in front of them, like guess how many jelly beans are in that jar if you want to vote. Uh, high poll taxes, all that sort of thing. 1920, August of 1920, finally, women win their fight. They've been fighting for over 80 years. Half the population can now vote. Yay. Well, except we got black females who now are under the same kind of restrictions as black males in many states. So we got that going on. All right, after World War II, 1948, finally, all Native Americans can vote. Do you see what's happening here? Now, 1965, the Voting Rights Act passes and it means that it protects the voting rights of minorities before they vote. You've heard a little bit about that from Mitchell and that was huge. 1971, 18 year olds can now vote. Until 1971, you had to be 21. 2013, Mitchell referred to the US Supreme Court in a five to four decision guts the heart of the Voting Rights Act. And because they did that, since 2013, more obstacles have been put in place for some voters in some states across the country. 2000, uh, 2020, Representative Jim Clyburn of South Carolina introduces the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It passes in the House of Representatives. We, have been to we were told there will be no vote in the Senate. They will not vote on it. So do you see what's happening here? Do you see the difference? The difference is people have to fight to vote and women had to fight to vote. But do you see how we do this in our country? We make it hard, we make it hard. And then we have something like the Voting Rights Act and then it's gutted. So I would say to you that if you're interested in everyone having a chance to vote, 
that you might look at whoever you're going to vote for to the US Congress and say, is this person going to vote for the Voting Rights Act when it comes up in 2021? I mean, if you care about race and justice, if you care about rights and responsibilities, I think that's an important question for each of us to be thinking about. Um, I, we all have power. And the question is, how are we going to use our power? And I think sometimes people forget that a vote is power. And that's why the League of Women Voters is very interested in everybody voting. We do voter education, we do registration, we do, um, we do, do vote411.org where you can co find out what your, on your ballot, what your people say about issues. I mean, that's the kind of stuff, that's our meat and potatoes um, of what we do. Uh, and I will say that suffrage and women voting has made a huge difference. And I will just give you one example um, because I know time is running out. But when in 1920 in August, mostly white women and some black women up north got the right to vote. And in November, they voted. And in January, where Congress came back, Cong members of Congress went, oh my gosh, all those women came and voted. We got to keep them happy. What are we going to do? I want to get reelected next time. So for the first time ever, Congress voted the Maternal Act. It had to, at that time, one in four children died before their first birthday. And this was the very first act social welfare act that had a bunch of money with it to help with midwives and early childhood and all the sorts of things that we know now make a difference. So my point only is the Congress got the message and one of their first acts was we want to be reelected, keep those women happy. So I would say we're still in the fight and we're still here and I think we're important. Thank you, Karen. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, in conversations about this election, the fact that this is the 100th year of the, uh, of the women's suffrage movement, the success of that movement, uh, can go overlooked in the current of other, yes. other issues, um, but it is, uh, it is a milestone in uh, American democracy. So yes. um, we do have a question. Dave Pittman, class of 1994 at Wofford College and professor of psychology asks, if you vote early in person through absentee ballot, will your vote be counted in the tally on election night or included afterwards? It depends. If you vote in person, if you vote in person, then your vote will be counted that night because they, they can do it off the machines. Um, if you mail in a ballot, it's going to take time. I just keep telling everybody, prepare to be patient. Prepare not to believe rumors. Just be patient. It's going to take days, maybe weeks, um, for us to find out about who's winning the races. Be patient and tell all your friends to be patient so that you're ready. Um, so in person, they'll know that night. Um, because you've used a machine and they can tally it up quickly. If it's a mail-in, it's going to take longer depending on where you live and how your local election commission is set up. Um, well, uh, now here's a question from uh, John Burbage, Wofford alum. Uh, what exactly do you mean when you say the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013? Yes. This in when it was gutted, um, what they did, Section 5, you heard Mitchell refer to that. Section 5 had been, had been working since 1965 so that in areas that had the, um, the, tr the history of making it difficult to vote for minorities, the federal government came in and looked to see what changes you were going to make to your districts, what election laws you were going to make. They had to be more fair. 
And so that is what worked from 1965 to 2013. And it made all the difference in the world. When they gutted it, they said, no, what has to happen is something has to have happened. And then after the fact, you can litigate. So you take out beforehand, working together, preventing problems, figuring out, we had it in Spartanburg. They, we, had a, we were under that and the Voting Rights Act and I've been around that, this stuff for 40 years and it all worked out pretty well. Um, but then, then in 2013, that was the huge difference. Yeah, it's kind of the pre-clearance type. Pre-clearance, yeah. Yes, that which Mitchell was referring to. Um, and the assumption that uh, the, the, past, the present was certainly not like the past, but most of the issues that had generated the Voting Rights Act had diminished substantially uh, in the intervening period, I think. Um, and what we have found out since 2013, there's all kinds of obstacles now out there that they're putting in the path and there's no pre-clearance, so it's all... Yeah. 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 Um, we have another question here uh, from Spencer Thomas. How do you foresee reactions going in November in swing states if we do, in fact, have a situation where it takes up to several weeks to declare a winner? And how do you recommend combating myths, myths truths as that manifests itself? And of course, that question ties into any thoughts on the Supreme Court nomination, which um, uh, the potential of litigation over uh, adjudicating the outcome is, uh, is pretty significant this time. Yes, it is. And I would say that um, I have no crystal ball. Um, all I can say is that the more that all of us are prepared and tell everybody we know to be prepared um, and to look for reliable sources um, and to combat them yourself, um, the rumors, I mean, the rumors, combat them. That's what we need to be prepared to do. Um, it's, it could be very tricky because there has been so much undermining in people's minds of the election process. Uh, and it's not healthy for the democracy. Uh, so it's going to take each of us doing wherever you live, doing your part to help get everybody settled down and let's just wait for the results. It's going to be hard. Yeah, it, it, uh, it is certainly the most interesting election year. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most important in our- in I, will, I will just tell you anecdotally, I've been in the League of Women Voters since uh, the late 70s and here in Spartanburg County. And we have never had the kind of interest that we have this year. Individuals, organizations calling us, wanting to, I mean, the, the level is very, very high, interest level. Excellent, well, that's good to hear because um, voting makes all the difference in the world. And um, we're voting uh, uh, for the future and our future resides with our students. Uh, and I want to welcome several of our students. In 2015, the college created a new effort, Wofford Votes, to improve the troubling statistics for student participation in the democratic process across the country. Um, in light of these efforts, voter registration and participation increased between the 2012 and 2016 elections. 83% of students registered to vote with, with almost 61% voting. In 2016, Wofford participated in the inaugural SOCON Votes Challenge. And in 2017, the college was recognized as a voter-friendly campus. We received a bronze seal in 2019 from the All In Democracy Challenge. That's what we expect from Wofford students. Fabulous. Our students are continuing that tradition. These students here with us today, and I'd like for each of them to share a little bit about their civic engagement efforts this fall. Our first student guest is Marcus Stallings, senior biology and Spanish major, pre-med concentration from Fort Mill, South Carolina. He's a member of the Wofford Rifle Team representing the Student Athlete Advisory Council. Marcus? 
Thank you very much, President Samhat, and uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. So first, I'd like to say that I'm very proud to represent SAC, our college's Student Athlete Advisory Committee. And this year, uh, in response to all the protests around the nation, SAC created a social justice committee with 25 Wofford student athletes serving in this area. And we've also created a One Love Unity graphic, t-shirts and helmet decal for our football. And on September 29th, all student athletes on all teams will wear the shirt and use the Wofford One Love hashtag across all social media. Uh, the timing of these events was chosen specifically to emphasize the upcoming election. So with that, we aim to encourage students to register to vote and become active in our political process. It's our privilege to vote, and it's something that many people fought for throughout our history, as we mentioned with the other speakers. So we really do wanna emphasize our voting right. Um, last week, the NCAA also focused its attention on voting, and the association adopted a proposal from the National Student Athlete Advisory Council to make election day a mandatory day off for all student athletes. So this means that no countable athletes athletic related activities will be required on that day for the student athletes. Uh, so no practices, no lifting, no conditioning, meeting, nothing student athlete related on election day. And this is very important to us because we want uh, student athletes um, who usually have athletic training filling our schedules. Um, we don't want that to get in the way of voting. We want our American right and our voices to be heard in uh, the political process. We don't want the fact that we're student athletes to try and get in the way of that. So on behalf of Wofford College SAC, I encourage all students to register to vote and become engaged in the workings of our government. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I appreciate it. Uh, and the efforts on behalf of SAC to promote social justice and participation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next, please welcome Christian Wright, a junior government major with a concentration in political theory and a minor in international affairs from Hagerstown, Maryland. Christian is the president of the College Republicans. Christian? Thank you for having me, President Samhat, and I'm honored to be here representing my organization. Um, the big, as the chair of the College Republicans organization here on campus, it is very easy to be labeled as a Republican and that you have to identify with everyone who's involved in the Republican Party. One of my founding, um, one of my founding pillars this year as chair and that I've worked with my executive on is implementing Republican um, goals as a, a Republican unity as a whole, to stand behind everyone in the party. We believe in the quote united front as many of our, many of our Republican senators and House representatives have said. When I was coming on here tonight, I was thinking of what politician do I look up to and what politician, um, what has he said or she said that um, represents what my organization is supporting this fall. We, so we encourage everyone to vote, but most importantly, importantly is we encourage everyone to vote what they believe in. Don't let someone dictate how you should vote. Vote for what you stand for. I think of someone like Tim, Senator Tim Scott or, of our very own state of South Carolina who says, I don't necessarily believe there's a message in the fact that I'm an African-American Republican. I think there's a message that America as a whole, we are now awake. We are looking at political constructs and we are fairly disappointed. I think the message in no matter where you come from and are in where you come from in this country, there is great potential. I believe in positive student involvement, whether it's here on campus or when you, whatever you learn on campus to take back home. This fall, we're working um, with our state level, with our with the other colleges in the state on supporting all the congressional races as well as city races. And lastly, and most importantly, is we, as a state, in working in the state of South Carolina, we are having statewide competitions, and we are also having state-by-state uh, -state competitions with states like Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and this, all other states in the Southeast on encouraging political involvement. So I thank you guys for having me here tonight, and it's an honor to represent this organization. Thank you so much, Christian. I appreciate that. Um, and Molly, uh, Molly Wells is next. She's a senior English major from Asheboro, North Carolina, uh, representing the College Democrats. Thank you, President Sam Hatt. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, 
right now, the top priority for the Wofford Democrats with the election coming up is registering students to vote and helping them request their absentee ballots. Uh, I consider myself very lucky to have members who are so active and who want to initiate real change this year um, within our Wofford bubble. Um, we've been registering students on campus and we had a very successful voter registration drive today in conjunction with the Wofford Republicans. And we also have plans to register voters in the Spartanburg community as well. Throughout the process of doing this work, we have just been really shocked at how complicated the process um, to become a registered voter can be and how voter restrictions have the power to truly distort our democracy. Um, because the fact is that some groups are disproportionately affected by voter suppression tactics, uh, including voters of color, young voters, the elderly, and people with disabilities. Um, personally, I would argue that perhaps politicians are scared that if they made it easy and convenient for certain groups of people to vote, then they would be voted out of office. Um, and so therefore there are, in my opinion, shameful methods in place to suppress the voices of voters. Um, we believe as an organization that our democracy loses its value when the vote is not accessible for all Americans. Uh, the vote is a pillar of our democracy and um, all Americans should have convenient access to that, to that right. Um, we've noticed um, throughout the process of registering students that voter ID laws and restrictions, the fact that South Carolina isn't doing early voting um, so students can go home when it's convenient for them over the weekend and vote, um, those things just aren't available to everyone and we are seeing blatant voter suppression firsthand in that regard. Um, so we're taking the effort very seriously in the next couple of months um, before the deadlines start to hit in October, um, making sure students are registered to vote, making sure that they have a plan and that they're prepared to make their voice heard, whether that is by going home early to vote, going home on November 3rd, or requesting their absentee ballot and sending it in from here at Wofford. Um, and so we are just really dedicated to ensuring that all students have that opportunity to vote and are educated about the issues that are on the ballot this year. Um, making the time to help students jump through these hurdles just because uh, we think that the stakes are just too high to let um, voter suppression get in the way of making a difference this year. Really excited to do some good work on campus and be more visible to the Wofford community. Thank you, Molly, Christian, and Marcus. Um, it's good to know that uh, the future of Wofford College and, the, and our future is in good hands with your leadership and we model here civility across the political spectrum and uh, models for engagement. Uh, one question is what is your sense of, uh, for all three of you, just to chime in briefly, very briefly, uh, what's your sense of how engaged the student body is in the upcoming election? And I know we've had some voting registration drives out here today, which is great. I, I can go first. Um, just a quick chime in. I would say, I would say I'm pretty confident in uh, our student body and our involvement in voting, considering, of course, um, the voting drive that just happened today and also the events that we plan to um, further encourage voting and increase awareness of it, I do think that we will be a very politically involved uh, campus. And there's discussions all across, um, like you'll find them in different classes and all across campus and, you know, modules like these that we're having right now. Um, these kind of discussions, these talks uh, gets everybody involved. And I've, I have a lot of confidence that our student body will be involved in politics. I can go next. Uh, I completely agree with Marcus. Um, I think that there's this popular idea that um, young voters are apathetic, um, but I just don't think that's the case. There was a, the percentage of young voters who turned out in the 2018 midterm election doubled that that turned out in 2014. Um, and so I anticipate that momentum to continue through the vote this year. And I truly do expect um, a high turnout among young voters this year. Great. Christian? I agree with Molly and Marcus. I think from what I've seen and within my organization alone and seeing just walking around on campus is students want to get involved, whether it's in organizations that all three of us represent on this, on this panel or whether it's in organizations that aren't represented here. I have seen countless students go up to each other and check in and say, hey, have you made sure that you registered to vote? Might have not been today at the fundraiser, but I've seen it before this fundraiser. I think as a Coming in here as a freshman in 2018, I was amazed in how involved some of the students were into the midterm elections. And that amazed me. 
but I must say that in my two years here, the energy that I'm seeing as a result of 2020 as a whole, I would, I would not be surprised if the percent doubles, if not triples for this election. Well, I tell you, it's nice to hear Democrats and Republicans in the student body say the word agree. Uh, so that's very reassuring to the future of the country. Um, I appreciate all your efforts and keep them up, uh, uh, all of you. Um, now, uh, as we close, uh, I'd like to once again thank George Tyson for advocating for this event and the others that are to follow during the course of the academic uh, year. And George, uh, let me invite you to say a few words. I know these issues are near and dear to your heart and things you fought for throughout your life. Thank you, Dr. Samhat. Um, thanks to all the participants and the panelists. It's been especially gratifying to hear the students tonight demonstrate their understanding of this most fundamental and sacred of American principles. The quest for the right to vote is one of the most compelling themes in American history with an arc extending from the Tea Party in the Boston Harbor to the Pettus Bridge and beyond. Voting should be the most nonpartisan of all issues and certainly it is the most powerful tool to affect change, including the pursuit of social justice. A potent force for equality under the law, especially for women was lost this week with the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. As many of you know, Justice Ginsburg was great friends with Justice Scalia. Although they almost uniformly disagreed politically and judicially, they greatly admired each other's intellect and shared time together through their love of opera. I want to challenge all of you to honor the memory of Justices Ginsburg and Scalia on an election day by going to vote with someone with whom you disagree. Find someone in the other party or someone with a different point of view and go with them to the polls. For absentee voting, fill out your ballots and go to the post box together. Participate together in this great American experiment. We have a republic, as Benjamin Franklin said, if only we can keep it. And the republic seems threatened, perhaps more so now than ever since 1860. So go vote together and then have a cup of coffee and talk about America. Listen to each other. We need to find common ground. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, appreciate those words. David and Karen and Mitchell, who had to l leave a little earlier, thank you for your participation and contributions. Christian, Molly, and Marcus, thank you so much for your leadership on campus. Let's drive that voting percentage up higher and higher and, and make a difference and do it together as a community, as George has just uh, guided us. I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight. And this concludes our event this evening. Um, as, as George said, let's have conversations across, uh, across the spectrum of politics in a most civil and respectful manner uh, and, and strengthen our community and our democracy together. Thank you all and have a good night.